Hello, dear listeners and those who have come to uh, listen to me. As it was said, my name is Gondar Bergmanis Korat. I am from NATO Strategic Communications Center of Excellence. I work as a lead scientist. And I also have a PhD in signal imaging, imaging uh, uh, the processing. But today we will talk about various social and technical aspects in uh, artificial intelligence, uh, about information wars and about cognitive effects that are being used uh, in information war. What I would like to start with is that it is very nice to understand that we live in a safe region where this new technology uh, that was uh, mentioned in the previous presentation uh, artificial intelligence is being regulated, but as uh, I would like to stress that uh, uh, states that are not as friendly to us, they uh, give us uh, challenges, but these countries don't have any ethics or any regulations regarding what they want to reach uh, in the information space regarding uh, in, in, when they look at our, uh, our audience. What I would like to add as well is that information war is a cognit cognitive level that links these physical activities that happen in the physical world with political confrontations. So these physical and uh, uh, physical and political confrontations uh, end up in the uh, uh, in the in internet environment. And most often in the context of technologies, I have to say that uh, we see a lot of examples where technologies are used uh, as uh, many voices to give one single message. And thus we can understand that technology is like a force builder, force multiplier. And this technology in many social platforms and in the environment increases the amount of uh, content, especially if we talk about generative AI. These help these disinformation uh, disseminators to sow doubt and introduce uh, manipulated information. I have to say, if you would go to a mail.ru uh, web page, this is Russia's uh, Defense Ministry's uh, web page, if you look for information war in the query, you would see a very specific description of what this information, this country understands uh, when, when it's about information war. One thing that is said, it's a psychological operation to manipulate with the public opinion of a country. And then the question I want to ask also to those who are here, I will not uh, uh, be waiting for an answer, but just think about it. How and why these countries can reach these goals? How can these countries use various resources that we use here in our region? to manipulate and to make sure this manipulation uh, takes place in various um, uh, groups of society. And one of the ways is uh, social media manipulation. And this is a screenshot from one of our uh, studies. This was an ex experiment in which we assessed how easy it is for us in our region uh, to manipulate uh, social platforms uh, used most often in our region. Here you can see various risk cat categories, uh, followers, uh, views, comments, uh, likes, reactions in various platforms, and how much this uh, can be bought through companies that are not in the European Union or Africa for 10 dollars, 
for 10, for 10 euros. If you look at uh, TikTok, 70,000 views for 10 euros can be bought in these platforms. So, and this is a way to manipulate with uh, these uh, views and uh, ways to uh, inter uh, involve the society. And if we look at, uh, compare it with the previous uh, periods before, up until the end of 2020s, it hasn't, hadn't, uh, 20, 2020, it hadn't improved. But we would expect that as the war in Ukraine started, the situation would improve, but we saw the results were com completely different. And of course, of course, there are comments about uh, ten dollars. It's not much, but uh, these uh, likes, likes, uh, likes are measured in thousands. So what we can understand, it's one of the tools for uh, countries that are not friendly to us, what they can use to manipulate with the content that uh, the users consume. It is not the only way. There is an additional way. If we look at the platform X, what I would like to underline is the platform X, as soon as Elon Musk overtook it and started uh, to manage this platform according to his opinions, uh, many changes were introduced into this uh, platform. And the first thing, these disinformation, uh, these disinformation people, people who provide this information, they are free to uh, act. And we saw that these uh, people uh, have uh, gained views uh, by more than uh, gained an, uh, an increase in views by more than 60 percent. It's also very interesting that uh, this platform allows to reach wider audiences if uh, various uh, social media accounts are verified. What I would like to show here on the left uh, side On the left side is NATO unverified and verified. This is an example with 118 uh, accounts that uh, spread information that uh, pro propagates uh, about Kremlin positive uh, information. So the number of uh, uh, entries in an X uh, increases when the, uh, decreases when the when the account when the account hasn't been verified. Uh, on the bottom, all those posts for the for those who the status is uh, verified, you can see that. Uh, these accounts, uh, malicious accounts, use these uh, opportunity to become verified to reach wider audiences, and it is uh, widely used. No, and and not only recommendation systems, but they are also used these opportunities, legal opportunities, to reach wider audiences. And on the right side, again, these malicious accounts, uh, here you can see the number of posts on the platform X were, uh, with, uh, related to Israel. We can see that the focus changes uh, in a certain period of time. So what we conclude is that these accounts are proactive, they are not passive, they follow the information and the events, global events, and use all these wide opportunities these social opportunities, social platforms provide. And if we look at various accounts, 
uh, where there is no real people behind. We call these unauthentic, uh, un 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 unreal accounts, and we call them bots and trolls. They are unreal, uh, unreal uh, civilians. And they provide uh, a false feedback. So this is a kind of manipulation, uh, content manipulation. And what these accounts do, they disseminate a lot of information, block this information flow, and then we start to see in our uh, in our feeds uh, actually spreads uh, content, actually spread content. And what is characteristic to these uh, bots is that uh, these accounts uh, they they change the focus depending on the specific moment in time. Uh, you can see a page, uh, you can see a picture with uh, dots, and these dots represent a topic. Circles. There is about a thousand entries for one account, and these are various topics uh, this uh, account is talking about. The, the bigger the circle, the, the, the more they are talking about uh, this topic. And if uh, the circles are close to each other, it means the topics are related. And here we can uh, see that there are many uh, small topics that you can often see, uh, often have, I don't know, maybe Bitcoin or sports or animals. And then there are big topics, that is politics, Ukraine, China, USA, and so on. So it's a specific model of behavior. And if we talk about this topic of uh, AI, in the previous presentations we already heard these uh, technical possibilities that uh, AI provides. And one of these uh, uh, one of these things is speed, how quickly we can generate a personalized content, we can uh, generate in uh, many languages. We can only not, we can generate not only text but also pictures, sounds, and so on. And we live in a, in a time when these models are becoming multimodal, which means that uh, these models that uh, OpenAI or Google are developing, they can understand the content both uh, the text and the images in the audio. And then these technical skills are used uh, to, can be used to manipulate the society, to polarize the society, to laundry, uh, launder, to flood, to provoke the society. And here we can talk about various cognitive effects. For example, uh, um, uh, information availability, uh, uh, fear, FOMO, fear of missing out, uh, group thinking, uh, there's also bandwagon. Selection, uh, selective uh, models that we, when, when we select certain uh, data to get uh, get yeah to get biased. So these are the main risks where malicious states can use the technologies to play with these biases in different groups of society. And of course the technology itself is neutral, we should not fear this technology. And in marketing different PR companies are already using this generative AI to create non-existent non models, non-existent persons as avatars, etc. And using them in different entertainment industries. But at the same time, what we see 
different information spaces. We can see screenshots here from actual cases from Telegram and from X, where this generative AI has been used to create a narrative. So on the left side we can see Telegram screenshots. One of them is one of my favorite examples where the Baltic anti-fascist group has an AI-generated image where in Pennsylvania allegedly they worship the devil in a kindergarten. And of course if we take a closer look at the image you can see that it's not real. So the attempt to demonize this Western world has been uh, part of their schedule for that day. And then we have a crowd with red flags and red hats. From a media literacy perspective, we can concentrate on this issue. To understand how this generative AI models works, we can see different threads that indicate that this image is not real, it's AI-generated. We should understand that these AI-generated models can replicate real-life events, but these models have not yet learned the physical world, the physical model around us. So if we see a crowd, if we take a deeper look into the crowd, every person here has the same expression on their face. So, of course, uh, nothing like this occurs in real life. And on the right side of the screen, we can see different examples uh, against Israel and for Palestine, also AI-generated. So, for example, people might have an extra hand or an extra finger. So, <coughs> different indicators that show that this is an AI-generated image. But, of course, this, do, this does not worry the people that are creating these images. They're trying to play with people's emotions. And in some situations they appeal to the empathy of per people so uh, to create an image that might resonate with specific groups of society. So this is one way you can apply this. And next, something that we have seen in our informational space is that AI is being used to generate voices. And, uh, the Slovak Progressive Party leader fell victim to this. His voice was cloned, or a similar voice to his was created. And we have seen examples where a similar voice to one of the UK's opposition leaders, politician's voice was faked, where this politician allegedly had, um, spoken very poorly to his employees and subordinates, and this and by leaking this type of audio recording in some news channels you can just create this perception of a person very quickly and this is this is the so-called anchoring bias where we have this first impression of a person and if from the environment around us we have this idea reinforced we create this confirmation bias that this person is bad and we already assume this in our mind and then it is very difficult to change the opinion for a large part of society. So this is the link between uh, the information and these cognitive biases. And another challenge which I would like to talk about today is what can we do and how well protected are we against this? There's a lot of talk going on about a system that has the goal to 
determine if content is AI generated or not. And this AI generated image shows that it is very hard to do. Of course, you have to try, but still, it is very difficult. First of all, if a new AI generational generative model has been created, it has its characteristics and these AI determining systems might not recognize them because they have not been trained on this data and if we even slightly manipulate this AI generated content we can artificially achieve the, the state where the AI recognition tool cannot work. For example, we can stretch or skew the image, add some noise to it. You can play around with the different uh, settings and thus manipulate the capacity of these recognition tools. And the same goes for uh, the text, for example, on open code. There's an example from a program that you can download on your desktop. It's GPT for all. And you can choose any open code models and do this uh, prompt engineering. And you can create a malicious text or hate speech. So using open code, so this open code industry isn't as regulated as large technology giants. And of course, what we are looking at uh, Stratcom COE is these AI technologies and how they are used and we are actively testing uh, engineering and data marking training in order to be able to more precisely do content analysis and follow these uh, uh, threatening countries' actions in the information space. So here are a few examples on uh, these language models. How do they improve their work with data? So we can have a deeper content analysis. We can move from a simple sentimental analysis to a very uh, advanced sentimental analysis. We can see if the specific content is negative just overall, but is it negative specifically towards a specific person, to a specific organization. We're very actively working on being able to follow threatening countries, threatening communication. So we can use these AI models to identify these different harmful narratives. So we can calculate how many of these threatening or harmful narratives appear in informational space. And last but not least, I want to mention this multimodality, which is one of the most recent cornerstones in the field of AI. So you can make these AI models describe very complex content images, for example, political memes. Here's an example by the GBT vision model. So what kind of description can you see when you're when you prompt it for this specific image analysis? And I would like to finish my presentation by saying that media literacy and critical thinking are a very important part of active de defense and protection. It is not enough to reinforce our geographical borders. We also have to reinforce media literacy and the information space and only 
in this way can we defend and protect our country. So that's why I'm very glad to be here and see that there's great interest in this technology. And I hope that we will see a continuation to this event in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Gundar.